This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, I'm Jeff Sobel. I'm the current chair of the Dean's Fellowship Committee in the History of Home Economics. And uh, we're here in Women's History Month, the very beginning of the month, to hear a presentation uh, by the 17th fellow uh, that's been awarded uh, as a fellowship for the study of the history of home economics. The first one was awarded in 1992, and Gwen Kay is the, the most recent recipient. Um, Gwen uh, is uh, an associate professor of history at SUNY Oswego. Uh, she got her undergraduate degree at Bowdoin College, her PhD at Yale. Her specialty was in women's history and the history of medicine and science. And uh, she's here to talk to us today about um, the transformation of the name and all the other transformations that went on uh, from home economics to human ecology at Cornell University. So I'll turn it over to Gwen. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the committee for the Dean's Fellowship in the History of Home Economics for awarding me the 2008 fellowship. The questions, help, and encouragement I received from the committee members over my six-week stay was very helpful, and the fellowship itself enabled me to re-examine, think, and reframe what I thought I would see as I began my research project, examining how and why the New York State College of Home Economics became the College of Human Ecology. This fits within my larger project, examining the changes that occurred in college-level home economics programs as they adapted or disappeared in evolving academic climates from the 1960s to the present day. I would especially like to acknowledge the help and suggestions of Elaine Angst, Eileen Keating, Sarah Keene, and the entire staff in the Division of Rare and Manuscript Collections. As all researchers know, staff always know their collections very well and can suggest new, important, and interesting paths, and in my case, people, to pursue. Also, my conversations with Margaret Rossiter have been invaluable. She has shaped my thinking and pushed me on this project in a variety of ways. Finally, my interview with Henry Rusciutti set a precedent. After time spent in multiple archives, talking with someone who lived through and was an active participant in the changes about which I had been reading, provided a nice counter to the paper trail. And the ability to ask questions and get answers was invaluable. My research time at Cornell is richer for the input and advice I received while I was here. And my larger project has been enhanced for the time the fellowship gave me. In 1965, in response to a question posed by the College Study Committee, Rachel Dardis contemplated the situation of the discipline of home economics as a whole and at the College of Home Economics at Cornell in particular. In a letter to Sarah Sally Blackwell, Dardis wrote, quote, the failure of home economics to meet the challenge of an affluent society is due mainly to the lack of an adequate training in the basic disciplines, such as economics, in particular welfare economics. Research by home economists is necessary in economics, since its orientation would be different than that done by other fields. However, not enough basic research is being done at this moment. As has happened before, Home, econo home economics is inclined to rely on other disciplines. If this attitude persists, it can only lead to the eventual decline of home economics. In this context, I might remark that the failure of home economics to upgrade its entire program by insisting on more work in the core disciplines may lead to the customary fate of all non-adaptive species, extinction. As it happens, Dardis may have been both right and wrong. Home economics at Cornell did adapt, but at other institutions, it is extinct. Over the next 40 minutes or so, I would like to outline what happens at Cornell and other institutions as they grappled with the question about the place of home economics in the changing academic climate of the 1960s and beyond. Ultimately, I argue, each school responded in ways appropriate for their time. Those programs that survived did so in large measure because of their ability to adapt and to think strategically in advance of some serious external forces that help transform HOMEC to HUMEC. When I began this project, I made some assumptions about the evolution of an academic discipline as it played out at college campuses across the country. Some of my assumptions were correct. 
the stronger home economic programs were at land-grant institutions. And as programs were shut down, those remained. I also believe that external forces in the 1960s, as they affected education, feminism, Title IX, colleges going coeducational, student activism on campuses, pressured changes in heavily feminized disciplines. And you should, of course, see the display outside related to related to the program that happened. I also expected that great society programming led to increased funding opportunities in nutrition, child development, family interaction, housing, and other areas at the core of home economics programs, which in turn led to greater emphasis on research akin to the sciences. But this occurred at the cost of extension work, previously the mainstay of many home economics programs, especially as regards funding. Finally, I expected that most of the changes within the discipline of home economics occurred in the late 1960s and 1970s, a period of great intellectual and academic ferment. I am happy to report that about some things I was correct, but dreadfully wrong about others. In this slow, cautious, and perhaps overly drawn out process of evaluating the College of Home Economics, Cornell did many things right, and a few things not so right. In the vignettes that follow, I will put the changes at Cornell into national context as we travel both in time from the 1960s to the 1980s to the 21st century and in space from New York to Iowa to Oregon. Home economics as an academic discipline emerged from the Lake Placid conferences, a 10-year run of conferences sponsored by Melville Dewey, the New York State historian. Perhaps the most comprehensive yet vague definition of home economics was that from the fourth Lake Placid Conference. Quote, home economics in its most comprehensive sense is the study of laws, conditions, principles, and ideals which are concerned on the one hand with man's immediate physical environment and on the other hand with his nature as a social being. And it is the study of the relationship between these two factors. It is a philosophical subject something to connect and bind together into a whole pieces of knowledge at present unrelated. From its existence as extension service to its presence as a college, home economics hoed a difficult road. On the one hand, home economics colleges provided a home for women scientists who would not be easily employed on college campuses. On the other hand, home economics programs became heavily feminized. Although the three legs of the academic stool teaching, research, and service are the same from department to department, college to college. Within colleges of home economics, the emphasis on extension service and resident teaching, the latter designation to differentiate teaching on campus and teaching elsewhere, weighed heavily so that research perceived perhaps received less attention than the other two legs. In time, the consequences of this reverberate negatively in many home economics programs as they came under fire. How did home economics evolve at Cornell? The presence of home economics was first broached at the legislative level in 1900 to place the New York State College of Home Economics at Cornell. Although this doesn't actually have a date, it just is left blank for 1900. The resolution, quote, to ask that the state recognize the important sociologic problems of the home and give to the household arts the same practical encouragement which is now given to agriculture and mechanical arts in state schools and colleges did not make it very far, in part because of another very large appropriation for the state university in 1900. Liberty Hyde Bailey, director of the College of Agriculture, believed that home economics was important. So he hired Martha Van Rensselaer, or Martha Van as everyone here calls her, to begin the reading courses for farmers' wives essentially extension work, and he saw this as an opening wedge. In 1905-1906, the first formal courses were offered in the College of Home Economics, College of Agriculture, itself a land-grant institution housed at Cornell. In 1909, Home Economics became a department, in 1919 a school, and in 1925 it became a college. In 1948, as part of the development of the State University of New York system, the College of Home Economics became a contract school within the SUNY system. But 
In 1939, when A.R. Mann, the dean of the Colleges of Agriculture and Home Economics, was elevated to provost, the alumni of the College of Home Economics mounted a campaign to push for a dean solely for their school. Moreover, they wanted the newly appointed dean to be a woman. They could not agree on a candidate. Some people wanted Flora Rose, some people wanted Martha Van if they couldn't co-direct. But they all agreed that a woman was perfectly suited and uniquely suited in a way that men could not. Alumni, the male graduates from the School of Hotel Administration, which was housed within the College of Home Economics, also supported a woman candidate. I use this brief example to highlight both the power of alumni and the very clear sense that a female was best suited for this job. The alumni network was, as I have learned in various states, quite strong, and the power wielded by these groups not inconsiderable. At Cornell in 1964, the university began to scrutinize itself and examine the colleges within the university. How did the colleges fit within the university's larger mission? Did these colleges exemplify the best of Cornell? Did the mission of SUNY and of Cornell overlap? And should it be sustained? That the College of Home Economics was one of the colleges being examined did not, in the beginning, seem especially out of the ordinary. 1964 was not a calm year in this country. Across this country, students empowered or emboldened by civil rights activism started to become active in organizations such as the Students for Democratic Society, and one of the posters up here is an SDS-sponsored event. Um, Lakota Sioux occupied Alcatraz, President Kennedy also launched the War on Poverty. The Great Society programs, in combination with changes in Social Security and the creation of health care for the elderly and the poor, shifted the public dynamic in terms of social activism and responsibility. Two, many of these programs offered research funding opportunities to determine how best to implement and configure them. And the places where research was being done on nutrition, public health, family interaction, child development, and family relationships was home economics. The first of what would become three separate committees in the evolution of Cornell's College of Home Economics was a college evaluation committee in 1964. The membership of this committee both was and was not diverse. To wit, the guideline committee included faculty from within the College of Home Economics, faculty from outside the college but within Cornell, in related departments, and other members from the larger world of higher education. The committee was heavily male, even on the Cornell side. Within the college itself, there were two women, Sally Blackwell and Helen Baer, and one male, Glenn Byer. But the larger Cornell faculty were all male, Norman Daly from Art, Harold Williams from Biochemistry and the Clinical Faculty of Medicine, and William Carmichael, Dean of the Graduate School of Business and Public Administration. The outside committee contained two men, T.R. McConnell, a professor of higher education at Berkeley, and Earl McGrath, the director of the Institute of Higher Education at Columbia, and one woman, Irma Ayers, dean of the School of Home Economics at the University of Delaware. The guideline committee, in turn, spawned another committee, the President's Committee to Study the College of Home Economics. Beginning in the fall of 1965, on the heels of the guideline committee's recommendations, this committee began to meet, again, members from within the College of Home Economics and outside the College of Home Economics. Again, most of the committee was male. The women serving on the chair on the committee, two of them were from the extension program, different ideas about teaching, different ideas about research and funding. And the chair, Sally Blackwell's Department of Home Economics Education, would actually disappear in the new reconfiguration. Over the, course, you didn't see that. over the course of the year, the committee met with various on-campus personnel to answer questions, such as how do home economics majors compare in terms of SAT scores and grades with students in other colleges? Several outside consultants came to the campus as well. When the committee issued its report in December 1966, known as the Blackwell Report, in recognition of Sarah Blackwell's heading the committee, it addressed the areas highlighted in the first Guidelines Committee report, the focus and organization of the new college, integration of disciplines and efforts, 
relevance of the school at all, community involvement, undergraduate and graduate enrollment, faculty recruitment, and a new name. Even before Title IX and the class action lawsuits to open up single sex institutions to women, the college determined that it needed to be more relevant, recruit faculty and students better, and start allowing men, for the first time, to enroll in the College of Home Economics. As a way to highlight the change in how the college perceived itself and its mission, the Blackwell Report suggested, as have the Guidelines Committee, that a new name might be the best way to signal a new vision. The process thus far had taken almost two years. The first committee led to a second, and many of the questions of the Guidelines Committee were clarified. With the retirement of Dean Helen Canayer inevitable in 1968 because of a mandatory retirement age, a unique opportunity presented itself. A new dean could shepherd in a new vision, even if she or he were willing to follow the suggestions of the college's own committees, the new dean might have more clout, more impact as a fresh face or even an outsider. In looking outside the college for successor, Cornell was, without perhaps meaning to, creating precedents for other schools in how to change, alter, and otherwise move the large and sometimes unwieldy discipline of home economics forward. The new challenge was how to implement the suggestions particularly the reorganization of the college. In doing so and emphasizing problem areas as suggested by the committee, rather than traditional disciplines, the college was forging a new path and emphasizing the interdisciplinary nature of home economics. Yet another committee was formed, the Organization Committee for the College of Home Economics. Over the course of a year, this committee transformed the suggestion of the two previous reports into a structure with four departments and two centers, the latter extremely interdisciplinary in nature, with the hope that faculty would be appointed to the research centers rather than formal departments. The Raschuti Report, so-called because Henry Raschuti chaired that committee, of 1968 became part of the blueprint for the new dean. In a radical departure, the new dean for the College of Home Economics was a male, David Knapp. Knapp had never headed a home economics co program before, but arrived to a bigger physical space with the completion of an addition to Martha Van Hall and more resources for his, to hire faculty. The emphasis in hiring faculty was science and research based. In some departments, this translated as male. In a shift to a new internal structure, some long-term faculty retired, thus opening up space for new hires. Many of the retirees were women who had devoted their careers to teaching or extension service, often at the expense of research, a common career path repeated elsewhere. At a time of great federal funds available for many of these concerns, increased student activism and feminism challenging the traditional notions of what and where women could study, home economics was in many ways under siege to prove its relevance to a newly skeptical student body. The final challenge, or perhaps the most symbolic but most important one, that Knapp faced was the name. Since Blackwell's report in December of 1966, a new name had been urged. The suggestion was not one taken lightly and led to rounds and rounds of faculty meetings, correspondence, and memos. Of six possible names, the vote was bunched up with the top two um, low vote getters here. Um, human ecology and human development and environment, and the others trailing. The others in rank order were human development, home economics, family and consumer science, and human welfare. In a second vote in 1967, a runoff of the top two vote getters, human development edged out human ecology. But you know the answer. So what happened? <laughs> Both President Perkins and Dean Knoyer were unhappy with the results obtained in a democratic process in a system <laughs> that is inherently autocratic. The name, change, the name change did not come up again until a few months into Dean Knapp's tenure when he raised the issue of a new name. The college faculty with a different composition approved human ecology at its new as its new name. And in January 1969, Knapp wrote to the alumni informing them of the new name and why it was changed. Through the long, perhaps arduous, five-year process, students were not consulted 
or included in the decision making. The larger State University of New York system was largely absent and alumni were only peripherally part of the process. In the end, I believe that all of the changes within the college, from organization to orientation, from name to number of students, were to one end, to appear serious, scientific, and research-driven as a discipline, and therefore inherently less female. A few other institutions underwent similar processes in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And then, to my dismay, things calmed down. I say dismay because in my original hypothesis, intellectual ferment, campus discord, students taking over buildings, um, research funds were all driving forces, or should have been, in the transformation of the discipline of home economics. But things remained relatively quiet in the 1970s and the 1980s. Then, in the Reagan recession of the mid-1980s, Pressures mounted as budgets across the country were scrutinized. In Iowa, the Board of Regents began to wonder why three programs in home economics at the University of Iowa, at the University of Northern Iowa, and at Iowa State University, all within a two and a half hour drive of each other, were concurrently open. The beginning of the end of the three separate schools of home economics at three different institutions started with an analysis of the programs in 1989. The outside reviewers Lena, doctors, Deans Lena Bailey and Karen Craig came from the programs at Ohio State and the University of Nebraska, respectively. In their examination of the three schools, they looked at duplication of services, how each program fit within the school's larger mission, and the quality of education. The University of Northern Iowa, UNI, based in Cedar Falls, was viewed by students and faculty alike as a regional school. Its home economics unit offered seven majors, had 220 students, and 14 full-time faculty. It was seen as viable. The highest priority of that faculty was instruction and service. Its graduates envisioned teaching home economics themselves at the primary school level. Iowa State University housed the land-grant institution in Iowa. One of the largest home economic programs within all land-grant institutions Iowa State's program boasted 29 possible majors in six departments, 1,410 students, and 81 and a half full-time faculty. The professional programs were geared to what students would do, and the master's and doctorate programs enhanced the undergraduate program. Many students chose the program at Iowa State based on its perceived quality, especially notable as many students in the home economics program were not native Iowans. By contrast, the program at the State University of Iowa, as the University of Iowa was then known, was clearly in trouble. One of 50 departments within the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, home economics formerly had had a distinguished history of quality programs. But from 237 undergraduates and 16 full-time faculty in 1983, the number of students had dropped to 115 and faculty to nine, in 1988-89 when the study was done. In comparison of the programs, there was much overlap, but only in two of the three programs. The University of Iowa's programs did not fare well when compared with those at the University of Northern Iowa or Iowa State. Side-by-side -side comparisons of child development, dietetics, family and communication service, fashion merchandising, food service and human nutrition, general home economics, home economics education, and housing and textiles reveal that not all programs are equal. Some had more resources, more support, and more connections within the community, and better perception by students. In general, Iowa State had the best resources, faculty, funding, space, research, connections, in-house. The University of Northern Iowa had a few resources, but did well with what it had, opting for internships, for example, to compensate for fewer faculty. While the University of Iowa did moderately well, but often by the virtue of nearby resources, such as the medical school for courses in gerontology and food science. Only Iowa State offered general home economics, geared especially for those students who would attend professional school in law, medicine, pharmacy, or public policy. Non-traditional students, minorities, and those of different ethnic backgrounds also found this a suitable option for their educational pursuits. Of some concern to the authors, 
Student data suggested that no student would consider attending any of the other institutions for the same program. And this appears multiple times throughout the report. Ultimately, Iowa State was viewed as a program that could and should serve as a model for the rest of the country. The program at the University of Northern Iowa was a competent program that was perhaps stretched by beyond what it could provide. And the department at the University of Iowa was seen as totally overwhelmed and understaffed. Although Bailey and Craig did not recommend eliminating any of the programs, the regents decided to do just that, targeting the weakest of the three at the University of Iowa for termination. Thus began their painful slide. The termination of the program at the University of Iowa was in some ways not a shock, given both the decrease of faculty and students. In August 1986, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts created a committee to examine the faculty, program, activities, and operations of the Department of Home Economics. Much like the committee at Cornell two decades earlier, the committee was heavily male. Save the chair, in fact, it was all male. All were full professors and held name chairs, including their outside evaluator, one Yuri Bronfenbrenner. The committee's report is concise, clear, and wastes no time getting to the point. What is the place of home economics at the University of Iowa? Contextualizing a little bit, they put the basis of other departments within liberal arts are positioned historically, and home economics doesn't fit. The field of home economics, the report stated, quote, is neither located at the bedrock of traditional arts education, nor is it perceived as being presently socially utile. Thus, in these times, it is subject to social scrutiny and concomitant misapprehension and stereotype, end of quote. By the end of the first section, Although the report is not making a recommendation per se, its point is clear. Quote, while the faculty have neither changed the name of the department nor radically altered the mission, they nevertheless are deeply concerned about societal attitudes towards their discipline. End quote. Reading through the report, some of the trouble within the department might be because of the very nature of the program itself. It was very interdisciplinary. A small faculty has limited options for majors. Pointing to two decades of turmoil and increasing numbers of interdisciplinary programs, such as women's studies, the diverse nature of home economics emerged as a problem. Core courses, such as math, chemistry, physics, biology, were taken outside in other departments. In an attempt to bolster the quality and reputation of faculty within the College of Liberal Arts at the same time, there were new and higher standards for hiring, tenure, and promotion. Although these policies were administered campus and university-wide, other departments suffered, the consequences were disproportionately high in home economics. The conclusion of the 1987 report set the stage for the 1989 review of the Iowa programs, suggesting that the decision to terminate this program was not unfounded. The late 1980s are awkward and uncomfortable times in the field of home economics, the report noted. The social changes occurring in the United States in the last two decades raise important questions about the orientation and capacity of the discipline. Home economics is experiencing something akin to an identity crisis. The field displays extreme intellectual diversity, a professional component, unusual organization, and other features which make the implementation of an effective and efficient academic curriculum challenging. Meanwhile, the economic programs encountered by universities and rigorous standards for promotion and tenure have added some thorny problems to the packed agenda of the Department of Home Economics." End quote. Part of the tension within the department may have sense stemmed from a sense that professionally oriented departments, such as interior design, were looked down upon within the College of Liberal Arts. Part of the tension also came from recent tenure decisions. With a wave of retirements, the department had one full professor and lean ranks at the associate level. Five recent tenure decisions had not gone well. Two had been got, not gotten past the department. One considered very strong by the department had been very soundly rejected by the dean. Midway through 1987, when the report was not yet completed, the dean of the college wrote to the chair of the department congratulating her and saying that the existence of the department was so critical did it not already exist, something like it would need to be invented. In his assessment, however, 
Bronfen Brenner called for either retaining the status quo, quote, as a risky leadership opportunity, or dismantling the department altogether, creating one focused on family studies and human development. The on-campus report was grim, even as it tried to be upbeat, and it did not call for dismantling the department. However, during his visit, Bronfen Brenner had told three faculty in fiber arts that they should consider looking elsewhere for jobs. It's not clear if people knew that he would say what he said in his report when he came to campus, but the department chair lodged complaints as soon as he made the comments and after his report came out and when she saw a copy of this letter as well. Following the 1989 report by the regents on the Iowa system, the accounting firm of KPMG analyzed the data and concluded that Iowa State's program should remain, University of Iowa's should not. The program at Northern Iowa should be dissolved in addition to that at University of Iowa, but that program is still in place. These recommendations did not sit well with department members at either of the schools targeted for dissolution. The chair at the University of Iowa wrote a rebuttal to the report questioning or clarifying some of the findings. For example, the program in interior design and the program in dietetics had been discontinued in 1988 which naturally led to a decrease in both faculty and students. Changing policy in tenure decisions had hit the department especially hard. Here are tenure decisions, and all these faculty have recently resigned. Most of the women, mostly it's women who have resigned and are now emerita. Most of them are at the assistant or associate professor level, suggesting an incentive to leave earlier. It was also pointed out that women faculty in the Department of Home Economics were 6.1% of all women in the College of Liberal Arts. Without home economics, the percentage of tenured women in the college dropped from 15% to 14%. And yet, the writing was on the wall. With the nature of the program's termination, what happened to the faculty? Some moved to other departments, some retired, and most heeded Bronfen Brenner's suggestion and went elsewhere and the University of Northern Iowa. The program changed its name in 1991, and while still small, increased requirements for faculty so that more faculty today have doctorates and fewer have master's degrees. The program is still small, but its graduates are loyal and most are employed locally. Out of Iowa then, there are some failures and some successes as the discipline of home economics realigned itself and renamed itself in the lean years of the 1980s. Lessons learned elsewhere meant that when the program at Iowa State changed, some changes were transparent with all constituencies as part of the process and some were not. Notably, the earlier changes at Iowa State happened more by fiat than democratic process. In 1986, before the study for the state regents, the Department of Home Economics discussed a merger with another department and declined. Months later, in the spring of 1987, the issue of a new name came up, and they declined. But in a little addendum at the bottom, in the May meeting, suddenly the name was changed anyway. So what happened? One of the regents for the state of Iowa for six years had been trying to change the name of home economics. She thought it was a detriment to the program. So at the April meeting of the state, Iowa State Board of Regents, a name change was proposed for the College of Home Economics to become the College of Family and Consumer Sciences. And so it happened, despite the faculty voting no. Finally, when a new name was needed at Iowa State in 2004, everyone was included in the process. The incentive for change was a proposed merger between the College of Education and the College of Family and Consumer Science. The entire thing happened in one calendar year. They had a unifying vision, decisions about administration, understanding about record, reporting structure, admission standards for students, accreditation for multiple agencies and organizations. The new name was discussed and voted on by students, faculty, staff, and alumni, both from inside and outside the newly formed college. Although not everyone was pleased with the final decision, Everyone was involved, and anyone who wanted a voice in the process was empowered and able to participate. In its final, thus far, 
uh, name change, Iowa State opted for transparency and strove to get buy-in from everyone. Because this change was the most recent, 2004, it used modern technology. All meeting minutes were posted on the web and available for anyone to look at them. And mistakes from the past, the Board of Regents changing the name of the program by themselves, did not happen. So what happens next at Oregon State University serves as an example of a final change of organization at one of the, another one of the oldest programs in the country. The program of home economics at Oregon State prides itself on being the fifth oldest in the country and it's the first west of the Rockies. Established in 1889 as a Department of Domestic Economy, by 1897, students could receive a master's or bachelor's degree in household science. The School of Home Economics became a college in 1983, just as other colleges of home economics were transforming their identities as reflected by new names or disappearing. At this moment of transition, as so often happens, a new dean was hired. The new dean, Kinsey Green, brought with her vast experience and a sense of home economics in the larger world. She had been the executive director of the American Home Economics Association. Some on campus were leery. She had very little academic experience, but she was, far and away, the best qualified candidate. As had occurred elsewhere, Oregon State changes seemed to happen suddenly without much internal discussion. But in 1964, discussion about the college future and the discipline suggests that faculty and administration were paying attention to larger educational trends. The two primary goals of the college, the 1964 plan noted, quote, are to provide a general education and to develop a professional excellence in subject matters of home economics. The total program of the school is implemented through instruction, through research and service. The projected enrollment continued to grow, a natural assumption, but for the opening of other department and program doors to female students. They didn't really see feminism coming. Although the assumptions by many women had been that the college was limiting its alumni to traditional life, the 1965 report took the long view. And they wrote at the very conclusion, since the subject of home economics constantly changes, it is important that the School of Home Economics frequently reexamine and adapt its program. A 1984 program for the next three to five years mentions nothing about the shift from a college school to a college. But within a few years of her arrival on campus, Kinsey Green started encouraging a new name change. Again, the same thing that happens in Iowa, is ha Iowa State is happening here. The School of Home Ec Education was about to disappear, and the School of Home Economics took in the School of Education. The new school that was to be created was seen as an opportunity for a new name, and the committee to change the name of the college lasted for two and a half years. The marriage was an uncomfortable one. Many in the School of Education were unhappy that they came second in the newly formed College of Home Economics and Education. And yet, when a new name was proposed, the com committee was formed. The committee examined names of other schools, received announcements of name changes, and heard from alumni, not happy ones, from the classes of 1922 and the class of 1948, voicing their displeasure. This tension mirrored the unhappiness elsewhere regarding change. Many of the alumni who taught home economics at the junior and senior high school level or practiced it within their homes, the Becky Homeckies, as one professor labeled them, perceived the name change as a slight rather than an understanding of a field that was always evolving. Further, the change highlighted the differences always in place between an academic discipline with a drive for research and funding to support it versus its practical application. The very tension that dogged many colleges of home economics as they strove to define themselves at not as a vocational training program but as a professional school. Alumni at, Ohio, at Oregon State were unhappy with the proposed change and were vocal in their displeasure, most notably in declines in giving. A woman who had given money for 50 years to the College of Home Economics stopped and gave it to Oregon State as a whole, every place but the School of Home Economics. <laughs> 
Although the process at Oregon State may have been deliberate, slow, and thoughtful, many people felt out of the loop, which raises the question about stakeholders. To whom is the college responsible? Its larger institution, its faculty and staff, its students, its former students? Many of the changes that occurred, as I have examined them, were prompted by a larger institutional sense of change, modernity, and context, leading to a project embarked upon by faculty with limited input from students and often none from graduates. Many of the alumni, at least at Oregon State, were alerted to possible changes by word of mouth at local American Home Economic Association meetings. And nothing official was inclusive until Iowa State's decision in 2004. That the alumni were so marginalized ignored or, high, or ignored is highlighted at Oregon State. When one of the trustees, a home economics graduate working at Quaker, wrote to the president asking him if the rumors that she had heard about the name change were true. And they were. What did Cornell do right and what did Cornell do wrong in the long view? It is to the college's credit that much was done right given that most other land grant institutions had not yet made changes with name, funding, and research imperatives or structure of their own colleges of home economics. The process here was slow and deliberate, essentially a carefully thought out five-year process in which one committee spawned another and then another, ultimately leading to a name change as it's an external symbol of an internal revolution. In some ways, the opportunity to hire a new dean because of a mandatory retirement age was fortuitous. But I think that it was in no way the driving force for change as I had originally suspected. Similarly, while there was pressure to bring in more research dollars, the funding for extension service, which accounted for one third of all research money in the College of Home Economics, did not shrink as great society programs and new healthcare imperatives created new research and funding opportunities. And there was no budgetary imperative to alter or shut down the college as there were on other places in the 1980s, or unfortunately today as well. On the other hand, some of the mistakes were pretty serious. In an era when student voices were increasingly strident, takeover of buildings on this campus, students and alumni were not part of the process. Students are often seen as temporary denizens, unable to see the larger picture, but today, few such committees are convened without at least an attempt to have a student representative. Similarly, the alumni were largely out of this process as well. And other colleges, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, Cornell did not send out change of name cards alerting colleagues across the country to their new identity in what seems to me a quintessentially female thing to do. It's good manners. Every card I have seen is engraved positive spin on what was clearly a wrenching decision, and I saw one engraved card that announced the shutdown of a program. In bringing in a male dean to guide the college in its transition from HOMEC to HUMEC, the message was unmistakable. The change was real, permanent, and the college was serious about its new identity. Its emphasis on research and new careers identified for its students. At the same time that Richard Dardis foresaw extinction as a possibility for home, economic, home economics, other colleagues were more optimistic. In response to the same memo from Sally Blackwell seeking college comments on the College Studies Committee's report, Betty Smith wrote, quote, all is now dark in the future for home economics. If we do build as I have indicated, I think home economics will emerge as a very important segment of the university. Home economics is in the unique position of being able to bridge the gap between the basic disciplines and the individual. The opportunity is there. Let's take advantage of it." End quote. And I'm happy to report that Smith was right and the opportunity has been taken. Thank you very much. I'm curious about, um, you didn't talk much about the choice of the term especially the ecology side of that term, how in your uh, looking at this did that play into the decision that was made uh, and uh, what kind of consideration was given to that use of that? Um, when the discussion is happening here on campus and there's parties lobbying for each of the six possible names, many people point out the 1960s meaning of ecology 
thinking about larger issues of behavior, social circumstances, use appropriately in biological sciences and behavioral sciences. And so that, for the people who are pushing for human ecology and for the president and the dean, is really the vision that they have. So they're thinking about ecology at a time when people who are thinking about what we would today consider ecology are talking about the environment. Because Cornell, um, Penn State, and Michigan State use variants on this term, it gets picked up. And it's one of the most common names that's used by every program as they change their name because it worked there. So we should think of ecology in a broad context, not a narrow scientific, bench science kind of way. But I just follow up there. There probably had not been many departments or programs in human ecology prior to this. So was the term in part uh, uh, a, an acceptable one because it didn't play to the vested interests of subjects in these colleges? Um, it was seen, I think Penn State had just made the name change and they had used it. Um, ecology was seen as the well, other people obviously wanted human development more, so they lost. Um, but ecology was seen as the same kind of thing, spanning the multiple disciplines and trying to get at the interdisciplinary nature that's inherent in what had been home economics. Does that yeah. answer your question? Well, I think we began to get on the human development. There clearly was for constituencies for human development, for family study, or for uh, and home economics and home economics <laughs> and others. And, and I'm wondering whether they whether this term was appealing not so much because of what it meant, but because it didn't allow any of those constituencies to be dominant uh, in the name. It really pro provided a name that had a, sort of a bigger tent. Looking at how the vote worked when there's a runoff between the two and human development wins, and then it doesn't two years later, it suggests to me that many of the people who were opposed to ecology were um, probably women who had been doing extension service, heavy teaching, not so much other kinds of research because their schedules hadn't enabled them to do that. And they were all gone. So there are new hires who are coming in who have a higher research profile and are thinking about doing research in different ways. And so ecology appeals to their sense of identity more than development does. Can I ask a question? Um, human ecology already was a conceptual issue, certainly mm -hmm. in biology with, with the early workers' cowls and people like that, but also in the social sciences. So you have the tradition from Robert Park and others at the University of Chicago and Amos Hawley. And in your review of the documents, were there any supporters or objections from either the biologists or sociologists or anthropologists that already claim that as a term or that didn't even come up? Because the votes are mostly are within the school itself, um, you certainly have people who are trained in anthropology, for example, and are now within the college, but they're such a small minority that they're not seeing this as much different from how they envision or interpret its um, larger meaning. When you touched upon the education department disappeared, yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that within Cornell? Do you know anything about why? I think it's part of the larger sense that the new school needs to be professional and the women who are going to, who are in the Department of Home Economics Education are going to clearly become teachers, although maybe Joan can correct me. Um, so I think that part of it is we don't want to think of training people just to be teachers. We want to think of training people to do any number of things and be less vocational, which is sort of what has been dogging home economics because of federal funding issues for its entire life. There doesn't seem to be a lot of protest, which strikes me as very sad, um, as are discussions about reorganizing and folding home economics education into the parceling the people out into other programs. And then when they retire, they're not going to be replaced by the same kinds of people who had done what they had done. Which leads, I should point out, to a shortage of home economics teachers. But that's a different story. So just to follow up on 
Um, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, here at Cornell, we um, got rid of nursing, teaching, social work, home economics. All of the, you know, core women's professions of the late 19th and 20th century. And I'm just wondering if you thought about how you want to uh, position your story of home economics um, in this larger history of the uh, demise of women's professions, particularly at higher status institutions. This makes me very sad to see these programs disappear. Um, I'm not quite sure yet how I'm going to do this. So hopefully if you ask me this question in a year, I'll have a better sense of my answer. I think that for many of these schools, it's about status. And those are seen as, I mean, they are seen as low status schools or schools where somebody else could pick up those, those students. And the administration might argue that they are opening opportunities for female students and giving them more choices. They don't have to study chemistry within the College of Human Ecology. They can do it in the College of Liberal Arts. But I think it's the reverse. I think that by eliminating nursing and teaching and home economic, these programs, they're forcing women into places where they might not have been otherwise, which ultimately is probably a good thing, but I think it's very, it's hard going. And talking to people um, in Iowa and also in Oregon, they eliminate program after program that serves a real need and they just decide it's not important, no one really needs that program. So I think they're trying to elevate the status of women and elevate the status of their schools, but it's the school's profile that's much more important. The, at, the University of, at the University of Iowa, when the department disappears, there are seven full-time faculty left. And they all go into different departments, and they're all gone within 10 years. So trying to find them new homes, they can't teach what they've been teaching because they're in a new department with a new program, with a new mission, with new core courses, it doesn't really end well. Uh, I'd just like to comment. I was actually a student here um, at College of Human Ecology. I started in home ed, I graduated in Human Ecology. Um, and the major home education was there when I started. Um, but there was very little interest in it. I think there were less than 10 people actually declared that as their major. And the courses, um, I believe, were fairly expensive, some of them to offer. So it just seemed like the, the writing was on the wall, even before we knew about all these other great changes that were And I think it becomes a chicken and an egg. There aren't lots of faculty because there aren't lots of students, and then well, we so it sort of feeds itself, it. and no one chose it. We were already a mindset that went more into human ecology than high tech. Um, we always felt rather defensive um, about the name home did not seem to fit what we were doing, even under the old curriculum. Um, so there was a lot going on. Well, but there's a real different sense of what female students should do in 1964 versus 1967 versus 1968 and 69. So you have changed, students have different expectations and assumptions when they come in also than the women who had graduated four years previously. So there's a lot going on. This is why I thought everything happened in the late 60s and early 70s, but it doesn't. I was wondering if you could um, say anything about the relationship between the um, home economics and human ecology and women's studies, particularly since it, it sounded like um, the 
college or home economics played an important role in that conference um, with Betty Friedan being here in 1969. And I was wondering if you see them starting together and perhaps diverging or. I don't know that I would say that paths diverged, but I think that the College of Home Economics in its last semester with that name was willing to sponsor the intercession program on the status of women speaks very powerfully to the support of faculty and administration within the college about what they see as well, the kinds of questions women should be thinking about and women should be asking. because. The next academic year, the first courses in women's studies are offered. And I think um, there's the part of the syllabus um, is in the exhibit. That's just up. Joan? In, uh, in, a, in the other exhibit that's online, um, I mean, can you help me with the URL, how, how to get there? <laughs> go to our, go, go to RNC, yeah. that library. This is a centennial right. exhibit that a number of us here worked on. I would argue that there was a very strong early feminist dimension to the home economics program at Cornell. And that it was unusual. Uh, it was embraced by Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and they were talented and highly trained women one in particular, a Harvard PhD in history, who gave uh, early home economics courses that were essentially uh, basic inter women's studies 101. Eleanor, and Eleanor Roosevelt had actually been a supporter of the program since the 1930s. Because when she is the first lady of the state of New York, she is writing to the college and encouraging more funding during the Depression for the college to sustain its mission. So she really supports the college for a very, very long time. Okay, I'd like to thank Gwen again. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.